I'd like to talk to you about, actually, who was here last year? Hands up, anybody? Jolly good to see repeat business. Okay, so I'm, from your perspective, I'm coming back to tell you what's happened over the last 12 months. Um, for the rest of us, I'd just like to scene set briefly to say that I have been spending some time working with New Voice Media uh, on a particular point of focus, and that point of focus is around the role that emotion has got to play uh, in the way that we engage with customers, whether it's in a service or in a sales context. Um, it started out, as all things often do, uh, just as one single white paper. Um, that grew into a roadshow, uh, and during the last nine months, it developed into something that a number of us have been doing together. And you can see the brands that have been uh, working with me. Um, and we have put together a program of activity saying, if indeed there is something important about the role of emotion in the way that we engage with customers, then possibly it changes the model that we've currently got. Um, and so designed a process to go through with four core questions. What the heck are we talking about? How does it work? Who does what and what changes? And that basic structure has allowed us to turn up four or five times together over that period of time um, and figure out a new way of doing things. Uh, a lot of that has been done uh, between sessions, using the material that we've gathered and put together online and very much a sort of spirit of going to way to research, listen particularly, by the way, to pick up some of the points Jerry's made, listen to the front line, listen to the people who actually know the customer experience, and then start to co-design new ways of doing stuff. Uh, and where we've got to is probably um, very early stages of test and learn. And what I understood last year, and what I understand this year, it's the difference, basically, of having engaged and listened and learned. And what I want to do in the next uh, period of time is just tell you some of the things that we've collectively learned together, particularly around of emotion theory, and also around of a new way, or a, a more precise way, really, of making sure that we listen at a very deep level to our customer. So, just a wee bit of uh, reporting, I suppose, in terms of the, the context. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, if you're bored, I apologize, but it is interesting that if you listen to people who report on the state of customer experience, uh, in this particular case, it's Nunwood and also Forrester, the industry has been flatlining for three years. Uh, I mean, given Jerry's talk, it's surprising it was only three years. But uh, the fact of the matter is, we have made some progress, but now we're not making any at the end of the day. And why, I wonder, is that? I think one of the reasons, not the only reason, is that we do live in an interconnected world and that thing called the internet has allowed us through social proof to discover very quickly a better mousetrap, a better experience. If they can do it, why can't you do that? And that basic thing ac uh, accelerates the speed with which we need to respond to customer needs and, and, and expectation. And this is something that most organizations are still not really geared up to. Most of us are content with doing business as usual, getting the numbers in a year, and we seem to absolutely be oblivious to the fact that what good looks like is being dynamically changed year on year, month on month, week on week, in fact, by the minute at the end of the day. And so we are sport as far as that is concerned. And if you then put that into the context of what's happening as we engage with customers, it's really important to understand there is no such thing as a neutral engagement, a neutral interaction. Something always happens. And in terms of the strength of a relationship that we've got with customers, you've either strengthened it or you've weakened it. It's worth thinking about that. Every single time somebody talks over a channel, a voice channel, a text channel, the net result of that is that relationship has moved a bit positively, negatively, at the end of the day. And the indications are, progressively, that we're snapping that relationship. It's more brittle than it ever used to be before. So for many organizations, they're beginning to discover, if we believe the research, that actually, one strike and you're out. Now, I don't think that applies to all contexts, all situations, all generations, necessarily. And by the way, this stat is interesting as a wake-up call, but what is much, much more significant, as far as I'm concerned, is that you know that for yourself. So what is the situation with your customers in which journeys, and how many times do you have forgiveness, and how many times 
do you find that they've disappeared because at the end of the day? And if you dig in a little bit deeper, possibly one of the reasons is that we're not really addressing what matters. You know, again, back to Jerry's point, what we see as matters from an inside out perspective seldom chimes and resonates with what matters and is the true priority of the customer. And we don't learn. And it's interesting if you look on the before and the after impact that we've had on customers at an emotional level, not a lot has changed on that dial. From 36% annoyed to just 22% annoyed. Great, well done. We've still got a fifth of customers annoyed with us at the end of the thing. We've moved from 16% to 11% on confusion. Congratulations on the clarity of your communication and engagement with the customers. You know, we haven't really moved the dial. And the reason that it's worth looking at emotion is that, and I'll talk a bit more about this, it's not just the functional outcome that matters to you as a customer. It's also the impact it's had on you. In other words, how you feel. And this is the language, and this is the real currency of what's driving those decisions to stay or to go. Here's an interesting thing, by the way. Those of you that have to still deliver on the classic KPIs, a round of cost, a round of efficiency, you can now transpose that into the language of emotion. Look at things like transfers, call times, NPS, all the stuff that we live and breathe. Isn't it interesting to know that joy leads to the shortest call? Fear leads to the most expensive. And if you look at the diagram there, why is that? Well, actually, it's because when the customer's getting upset, they're going to find a way through any which way. And that probably is looking at you and going, you just ain't in power here. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. I want to speak to someone that knows what they're doing. Therefore, transfers get exaggerated at the end of the day. Anger leads to the lowest NPS. And in parentheses, by the way, there's anger and there's anger, yeah? And know the difference between frustration and fury. You best do, because that's a different state that the customer's in. So, in summary, our own research shows that call center interactions that were more emotionally negative lead to longer calls, more frequent transfers, lower likelihood of customer recommending the company to others. So what I'm really saying is, can you evolve? Can you imagine yourself evolving as an organization to the point where your CEO says, as part of the sales planning process next year, I want an X percent improvement in joy as my goal setting. Because they know that that translates behaviorally into growth and development at the end of the day. So I'm trying to introduce you to the language of emotion and its connection to what we obsess about in a business context. Here's another piece of evidence, and it's all over the place. This is US-based. So basically, satisfaction is driven in this particular context of health plans by how the customer felt during that service interaction, when they're trying to get hold of things like benefits and solving stuff. And people that feel valued and appreciated, da -da, guess what? Well, the guess what is they're going to stick around and they're going to say good things and you don't get a prize for guessing the opposite. You know, we know this at a certain level, but we don't necessarily act on that insight at the end of the day. So clearly, if that's the evidence, you spend all that money communicating, producing websites that don't make a difference and all the rest of the stuff. Why are we then doing the stupid thing when we've got customers in relationship with us and driving them away by not learning that stuff? So, if you start to think about it and join those two things together, there is a connection. And this isn't just a conversation, by the way, at Emotion. I would say that this is something we need to be doing in CX because at the moment, CX is rather like, you know, a cult. It's rather like a religion where if I'm sitting up doing the sermon right now, my problem is not the people that turned up to church on Sunday. You're the congregation. The problem I've got is the people that don't turn up because they don't believe. And the real thing is, we love the behavior associated with CX. I'm passionate right now because I'm right into the whole thing about emotive CX. But the problem is, so what, as far as the traditional way of looking at stuff? And there's a formula sitting in the middle of it in terms of connecting behavior to commercial outcomes. And it roughly looks like this. You have to build your own, by the way. So when customers are left in these emotive states and everything from very positive to very negative, 
they're going to react to you in the following kind of way. Again, from very high to very low. Whatever your particular score is, it really doesn't matter if it's satisfaction, NPS, effort, or anything new at the end of the day. It's whatever they do to say, Ugh, or hmm, to you at the end of the day. And that is going to result in behavior which we can then cash in that we understand as an organization. So in other words, we have a connection between what we're doing on every single engagement with a customer in a service context and the things that the boardroom traditionally think are important. Now, why that's important is we still treat many, many contact centers as a dustpan and brush lowest cost, seeing no connection in terms of its value to the things that we're trying to do as a business. And one of the reasons why this is powerful is it allows us to connect those two worlds together. So there's my scene setting, all right? Reasons to be interested. Let's dip in and have a bit of fun in, in, in terms of the psychology or the neurology, the neuroscience. And I spent, one of the things I did in this year was I, I spent much more time reading. And I've come across some really interesting material and a whole movement of thought that's been done at the moment in terms of looking at how we behave as humans through the lens of looking at brains and the scanning you can do on brains and what that teaches us about emotion and also what that teaches us as to why emotion exists. So, just to start the picture, by the way, and this is all courtesy of an amazing human called Lisa Feldman, written a great book called How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. Uh, if you enjoy it, totally recommend it. And she starts off in one part of her, her, her thing by saying, just imagine for the sake of discussion, you're a brain. You're born with a mission, which is to basically keep yourself and the person you're in safe. That's your core mission. And you wake up day one with a bit of a bind as far as the mission's concerned, because you're in a black box called a skull. That's a bit of a problem if you're going to be responding to the world as it happens around you. So the first thing you kind of do in life is you begin to translate that into understandable experience. So, you know, air pressure becomes sounds that you can make sense of. Light, light waves become things that you can see. And of course, the chemical is the experience in the sense of smell. And quickly, you bank those in terms of experience, previous experience, and they become an incredibly important source of information in terms of what do you do? How do you respond to a particular situation? And one of the very low-level, persistent ways in which we react to reality is at a bodily level. Shivers, tightness, aches, pains, etc. All part of this overall response. Now, when we're actually looking at the process, which is really, by the way, a mind-blowing process, you see, right now, in terms of those core things, what you're doing, looking at me, it seems effortless, doesn't it? You're looking at a bloke on a stage. But actually, outside of your conscious awareness, because it really would blow your conscious mind, you are doing something quite extraordinary. You're predicting about what you're just about to experience. You are simulating, based on previous experiences, everything that looks like a bloke on a stage and everything that looks like a screen and all the other conferences you've ever been to and information you've ever seen. And you're comparing that against previous experience, and then you are resolving the difference between what it seems to be and what the evidence of the input actually is. If it lines up, great. If it doesn't line up, by the way, and you decide you're more right than what's coming in, that's then called cognitive bias. Interesting. Now, that's happening at an incredibly fast period of time. Just to give you an example, you just simulated that. What's interesting from the emotion point of view, and this is where some of the development work is going on, is that there is not a part of your brain that's all about core, raw emotion based on a reptile brain. I started at the beginning of the year believing that. I'm now disabused of that theory. It's a whole brain activity. And one of the reasons, very simply, is the brain is highly optimized. You know, of all the food that you consume, the brain consumes 30% of the glucose. It's a hog in terms of energy consumption. So it's also optimized in terms of how to use that. So a lot of the time, by the way, you are right now using a lot of that glucose because you're consciously engaging with information. 
But if you reflect on it for a second, do you know how you got dressed this morning, how you had breakfast, how you got here on the train? Not a bit of it. All learnt behaviour, learning on a very low level of fuel as far as the brain is concerned. Patterns in order to optimise that. And therefore, naturally, the brain uses whatever is available at the time in terms of cascades of neurons in order to be able to respond appropriately. So number one point, there is no actual part of the brain which is kind of reptile-based and that's where anger sits and disgust sits at the end of the day. That's a change, by the way, in terms of current theory. <clears throat> so it's blown one of the favourite things I loved, which was that movie. It still remains remarkable, it's wonderfully insightful, but I'm afraid to say you don't have compartmentalised experiences like that. It doesn't work like that. I'll show you in a minute why. More interestingly, there is no such thing as a preset way of demonstrating emotion. Now this is, by the way, if you're interested, profoundly important in terms of things like emotive AI, facial recognition. And the training data that's driving it is based upon a belief that says anger always physically looks exactly the same. Every single person in this room multiplied by the rest of the planet all express anger, sadness, fear in the same way. And by the way, if you get down to a fine enough level of detail in terms of how bits of your face, the hundred and whatever muscles you've got, I can shove that into an algorithm. I can therefore tell when someone's angry or not. The trouble is, the science said, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't scale like that. Okay, well, that's interesting. If that's the case, how come I can still recognize emotion? Let's say you've been angry. Because that is an experience I have, and that's true. And the reason why that is, is because emotion in that sense, it's a social reality. It's a learnt thing. It's not triggered. It's not automated. It's culturally specific, learnt through family, learnt through the way that you grow. And if you look at it through that particular lens, it explains why we do have a common currency, but it also explains another interesting thing, that it is culturally specific as well. And so just for a second, if you compare emotion to colour, what's interesting is, in terms of the way your brain has translated that, in reality, it's light waves, a spectrums with frequency. Now, what we experience, the mental concepts that we've come up with, is distinct colours, isn't it? Red, yellow, green. That's how we see it. So if you go to Google and you go to the Russian Google site, and you go to the English or the US Google site, and you put rainbow in, they will feed you back different images. Because as far as the Russians are concerned, there ain't just a single blue. In the spectrum of blueness, their social reality is there's at least two. Probably, if you go and talk to a great artist, and you say, could I have it in blue? That would just be a nonsense thing. They'd say, well, what colour of blue? And they'd reel you off half a dozen to a dozen because they've meditated on what blue looks like a lot. And they'd be able to reel it off. So in other words, the way that we deal with things is to put boundaries around the things and segment it. What we don't tend to do is to see the flow between the things. So kind of what's interesting about this is that emotions are equally culturally specific. Not all the time, but there are certain ways that certain tribes have nailed an experience by putting a word to it that we haven't yet done. Now, I'm about to humiliate myself by giving you some culturally specific ones, and my ability to speak Greek, Czech, and the rest sucks. So if anybody's in the audience that actually knows the real word, please shout it out, otherwise I'll have a go, but don't go yaboo afterwards, because I ain't going to be good at it. So, who can pronounce that? Who's Greek? Anyone? All right. Stenohoria. Can't be called on that one. A feeling of doom, hopelessness, suffocation, and constriction. We've had times in our life when we get a bit of that going down, but did you know there was a word for it? Amazing. There's a new emotion you've now learnt. Next time, by the way, you model that experience, you've got a word. Anyone can do that in Dutch? Thank you. Can you say it a bit louder? Beautiful. 
Now, I did this on Monday, by the way, and I was informed that at home is not a physical location. It's more the feeling of that. But again, I can relate to that, you know. You're just in that zone. And that's what it's called. Never knew that before. I love this one. Torment of one's own misery combined with the desire for revenge. We, have all, we all have those moments. And here's my favorite one. I'm not even going to try and do that, but it's when someone has done you a favor that you didn't want from them and which may have caused you difficulty, but you're required to be grateful for anyway. <laughs> and without stereotyping too much, isn't that a wonderfully Japanese issue in life, which we all share off to a degree? So emotions are common, but they're also unique. And the thing for us, which is interesting, is that says the following. It's learnable. It's teachable. You can develop. The language we're using in the course is emotional granularity. Actually, that's Lisa Feldman's language. And it means the larger our emotional vocabulary, the better we can help customers. So in other words, rather than just that, ooh, I feel bad, which is okay, if you have got the ability to capture the emotion accurately, because we're in service, and help therefore make form of a feeling of an emotion, you're going to be much better at resolving it at the end of the day. Because back at the top of the discussion, it's not just about functional outcome, is it? It's about emotional. And by the way, just as evidence, two people talk, truly understand what happens when you look through the lens of the scanning. Well, it's amazing. Brains literally synchronize. Dancing parallel, the activity is mirrored with a short delay in the other brain. So, amazing thing that's actually, actually taking place in terms of that exchange of information and pure experience. So that's one bit just to give you a little taste on that, okay? And some of the developing ideas around of that. And the other thing is to say that maybe we need to improve the way in which we're teaching, monitoring, quality controlling, exploring the way that we engage with customers. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, when you open requires this model. By the way, you shouldn't be using humans for that. That should really be self-serve or possibly even proactive. So this is really in three use cases for me, generically when it's emotional, when it's complex, and when it matters to the relationship. And part of my reasoning for this, by the way, is assuming that conversational AI, bots, RPA, does its business over the next five to six years, where do the humans go? My answer is into these situations with a corresponding upskilling of capability. So the model. One of the things, by the way, for reasons I'll explain in just a tick, is the importance of moving us out of a negative to a positive state. I'll explain that in a second. So part of the dimensions of this is to get where the customer's coming from emotionally and take them to a better place. That's part of the responsibility. So we're moving them across journeys. Here are some for instances. You know what it's like to be ignored in a service context? That's really not where it's at. Being listened to matters, particularly in this world where nobody listens. Being upset, relaxed, stressed, relieved, worried, confident, disappointed, reassured. Now the point is that does happen implicitly in good communication. I'm just bringing that to the surface and saying these really have to be things that we should be focusing upon in a deliberate, scalable way at the end of the day. Now what the other interesting thing again, and this is very much a metaphor, okay, and this is the Daniel... Kahneman, uh, Kahneman stuff, is that actually we don't process everything. You didn't remember what you did at breakfast, da 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 da. We're highly selective. And we're highly selective in the sense that there's a difference between what we experience and what we remember at the end of the day. And what we tend to remember is peak end. We tend to remember what happens at the end. Who won on the last, um, we just had the world championships. Anybody remember who won the four by fours? Anybody watch it? Yes, can you remember who came fourth? Very impressive, actually. You've ruined my theory. <laughs> that might have been because it was England. I don't know. 
I don't know. We tend, though, to group things easily by things that remain in our minds. And by the way, peak experiences can be positive or negative at the end of the day. Hang about, I've also got a build here that wants to move on. So that's half of the thing that we're trying to do. The other half is how do we then organize ourselves to get that to be happening across a communication? And this is modeled on active listening. And this is actually exceedingly difficult to do for humans. I've done lots of training on this. To capture a full accurate version, make sense of it in the exact same way that the customer intended. And if I could use Jerry's language, it's about getting out of the way long enough to make the customer the point of focus. Difficult to do, by the way. And the specific mechanics of that iterate around of these skills. And I'll just break it down for you in terms of how it happens. So in the first instance, what's going on? You know, what's the story behind the customer need? I'll give you one. Um, common thing, trying to get this thing fixed multiple times over, but having unpacked the backstory, that had a further impact that you may not have known. By the way, I was late for an important meeting. Yeah, that's the consequence of your ineptitude around of my particular situation. How do I feel? Well, you know, tension, breathing, heartbeat. I feel ignored. And by the way, I also feel blamed because I was late to the meeting I was meant to be presenting at. My colleagues felt let down. My boss was pissed at me. And there's the full backstory in terms of what's actually coming in on a service call called, oh, by the way, can I help you today? So how does the customer feel? No prize for that. But there's the full gestalt. There's the full scenario that you're actually trying to deal with through the iteration of understand, recognize, acknowledge, getting the backstory, the situation, but also the feelings and emotions that come together as a full package. And then when you get to this next stage, what you're really doing now is making sure that you ain't just projected and you ain't just done an automated, I know this because it's another complaint. It must be the same situation, the same reaction. No, no, no. You bother to make sure that that actually fits against what the customer wants. Because interestingly, in the order of things, customers have got priorities in terms of what things mean to them. What actually is justice? What actually matters most to me in this situation? You have to check that out against expectation at the end of the day, both functional and emotional needs. And then, of course, you deliver it. And what you're also delivering is the most positive memory of that event. You can't, by the way, force that. That's a function of you being effective at the end of the day. But it's also a question of taking them from a negative to a positive. Because, as we saw earlier on, positive emotions are building rather than destroying relationship. So you've got a journey. What's going on? What does better look like? And also, what's the ideal memory that you're delivering? So that's the conversational flow that we've been experimenting with and we've been starting to train up teams on. So just to land a few ideas on the basis of the fact the last things you remember in a thing are the things you take away. Emotion is something I think we've forgotten too much about when we talk about customer experience. We've gotten too processy around the journeys. Emotion is the thing that drives our decisions as humans. Emotions, by the way, are not preordained, but they are part of a human's ability to understand a situation and react. If we can open up to that, we have a much better way of understanding and helping customers. Each time we engage in any context, retail, call center, online, which by the way ought to be pretty much the same, every single one of those interactions matter. Are you organized to see that to optimize that, to make the most of that. And by the way, the good news is, the way that the customer ends up and then subsequently remembers that whole thing, the reality that is generated, can be optimized because memories can change. So, that's what we're actually doing um, on the course. We're about to run a new one in January. If anyone's interested, please come along. Um, I'm hanging out there during the break time for the rest of the day. We've written about that, so there's a lot more material if you're interested. And if there's anybody in the room, by the way, from the financial services space, we're about to go into this conversation uh, over a much longer period of time, if you want to explore it in the context of banking, insurance, etc. And we're having something with uh, a number of us in New Voice Media uh, within the next couple of weeks. Again, check that out uh, if you've got time. 
But thank you for your attention. I hope that was of interest.